Hello, uh, very good evening to you ladies and gentlemen. I welcome all of you, both panelists and the members of the audience on behalf of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for the 56th webinar of the first continuous webinar series organized aiming at continuous professional development. I also must remind you all, this is the 99th webinar of all the webinars organized by the BASL collectively. And tomorrow we mark the 100th webinar and we will celebrate it tomorrow. Uh, I'm grateful to the management committee and the seminars committee of the Bar Association of Sri Lanka for their lead and dedication, even through turbulent times. Uh, and thanks to them, though socially distanced as we should be, we are connected virtually via these webinars that bring together members of the bar, law students, and even other professionals from all parts of the island as well as overseas. Uh, today's topic too is one which is beneficial to members of the legal fraternity and law students as we wish to discuss an important area of law. The topic for the 56th webinar, that is today's webinar, will be higher purchase and leasing. To discuss this area in detail and enlighten us on the legal as well as the practical aspects, we have a fabulous panel of experts. Uh, it is my privilege to welcome the panelists of today on board and of course introduce them to you all. Uh, first, let me introduce to you Ms. Shiranti Gunabharatana, attorney at law. She was enrolled as an attorney at law in the year 1975. She was a legal officer of People's Bank and thereafter the, the Deputy General Manager at Mercantile Credit Limited and an advisor to the Mercantile Group of Companies. She is presently a partner of Shiranti Gunawardana Associates and a consultant to the Finance House Associates. Next, we have with us Mr. Ravi Algama, attorney at law. He has a practice of over 38 years as a counsel, primarily focusing on civil and labor matters, as well as as an arbitrator. He co-founded Environmental Foundation Limited in 1981 and has held several posts at the Environmental Foundation Limited, including the post of chairman. He's also a visiting lecturer at the University of Colombo, University of Sabaragamur and the Open University. We also have with us Mr. Vidura Ranavaka, attorney at law. He has 20 years of practice in both civil and criminal fields. He served as a tutor and an examiner at the Sri Lanka Law College. Mr. Ranavaka is also a member of the Civil Law Reform Committee appointed by the Ministry of Justice. Finally, let me introduce to you the moderator of the day, Mr. Chinta Kamendis, attorney at law. He has a Bachelor of Laws degree from the University of London and a Master of Laws degree from the Queen Mary University of London in commercial and corporate law. He has a practice of over 15 years and specializes in commercial and corporate law. So that will be your panel for today. Members who are connected via Zoom are welcome to post their questions via the Q&A option that is available to you. The panelists will do their best to answer your questions during their session. Uh, so to begin with today's discussion, I now hand over the session to the moderator of the day. I hope all of you have an informative one. Over to you, Chintika. Chintika. A very warm welcome to you all. The topic of discussion today is uh, higher purchase and finance leasing as Uma introduced. Thank you for that Uma. So we have a discussion and after the discussion we'll be having a half an hour's Q&A session and you are, please feel free to send any um, questions you have. The questions need not be limited to the topics on the discussion. You can ask any, any question relating to these topics that we're discussing today. Now, Higher purchase and finance leasing are very popular facilities uh, in Sri Lanka. Banks and finance institutions both um, engage in giving out finance leasing and higher purchase. But there seems to be some confusion generally among Sri Lankans as to what these two facilities are. There are two different concepts as well as two different legal regimes. Higher purchase, as you know, is 
governed by the Consumer Credit Act number 29 of 1982, whereas finance leasing is governed by the Finance Leasing Act number 56 of 2000. So to discuss these topics, our distinguished panelists are ready to help us in understand what these topics are. Let me first invite Mr. Ravi Agama to explain the concept of finance leasing. Over to you, sir. Uh, actually, uh, Chintaka, I, I would be introducing the subject of higher purchase, leaving it to Mrs. Shiranti Gunawardner to deal with finance leasing. It's appropriate that we start with higher purchase this seminar because higher purchase was the older, the more senior sort of member of the regime of instruments which gave rise to financing of vehicles, of furniture, of household electrical equipment and durables, consumer durables. So higher purchase until the coming into operation of the Consumer Credit Act, which Shintaka mentioned, Act number 29 of 1982, it came into operation on the 15th of June, 1983. The, till then, the law relating to higher purchase law, the, higher, the law relating to higher purchase in Sri Lanka was necessarily judge-made law, mainly based on decisions of English courts and a few cases in our country as well. Higher purchase to the layman is the same thing as purchase on credit, where the purchase price is paid in installments. But in the eyes of the law, the two are distinct and separate in their legal effect. In credit sales, or installment sales, the property in the goods passes on the conclusion of the contract and the delivery of the goods to the buyer. This was considered, the distinction was considered by a bench in the case of mercantile credit versus silver, which is recorded in 76 NLR, page 193, where the then Chief Justice, HNG Fernando, said at page 200, but in the instant case, the circumstance that the plaintiff paid the balance purchase price only two weeks after the date of the hiring did not have the effect that title remained in the seller until payment was made. The learned trial judge, the learned chief justice said, fell into a surprising error in thinking that title to goods delivered by a vendor under a contract of sale cannot pass to the purchaser until payment is made. On his reasoning, the bread which I consume today will become my bread only when I pay the baker's bill next month. There was obviously in this case a sale to the plaintiff on credit on his implied promise to pay the balance of the purchase price. Yet, it is out of credit sales that higher purchase in its modern form developed. Credit sales were known even to the ancient world. And even before the Roman era, it was widespread in ancient Egypt, particularly in respect of land. The 17th century saw the need for preserving in the seller some security in respect of these goods or whatever was sold under credit. And that 
resulted in the development of a reservation of the ownership of the goods sold in the cellar till the full purchase price was paid. So, <clears throat> the rationale for a different, a different form of contract giving birth to higher purchase can be stated as the need to preserve in the seller some form of security in respect of goods sold on credit until the payment of the full purchase price. These developments were necessitated by the rapid expansion of trade and industrial development in the 19th century and first took place in the USA in 1807 when the New York firm Coppert, Waite and Sons introduced installment selling in furniture. That was the birth of higher purchase contracts. But the contract actually rapidly gained in popularity only after the Singer Sewing Machine Company adopted it. Judge Veeramantri states in his book, The Law in Crisis, at page 219, in more modern times, the popularity of the Singer Sewing Machine and the demand for it by many persons who could not lay down the necessary purchase price hastened the development of a new form of contract the higher purchase contract. The contract was probably first introduced to our country also, then called Ceylon, in the late 19th century, also by the Singer Sewing Machine Company, when they established a branch in Ceylon in 1877. In 1903, there was a celebrity, you know, before that, there was an earlier decision in 1895 called Helby versus Matthews. You could read it. 1895, AC 71, where the House of Lords laid down the law of higher purchase as a contract where the owner delivers the goods to the hirer with the agreement to pay the fixed sum in installments. And the hirer becomes the owner by exercising an option to purchase. So you will see a higher purchase contract requires three elements. A movable property, as we now know it, an owner, and a hirer. Even though possession passes to the hirer, the owner retains the ownership until the end of the period of payments. So in 1903, just only eight years after Helby versus Matthews, which was the earliest case in England in high purchase, the Supreme Court in our country considered the question whether goods comprised in a high purchase agreement would get caught up in a landlord's lien for arrears of rent. This was the case, Anglo Oriental Furnishing Company versus Samarasimha, 7 NLR, page 12. Thereafter, in Mayber and Son versus De Silva, 12 CLR 211, the Supreme Court held once again that the hire purchaser had only the option of becoming the owner of the vehicle hired on duly performing certain specified conditions. Thus, the validity of higher purchase agreements received judicial recognition in our country early in the day. So higher purchase developed as an agreement under which an owner lets goods out on hire and further agrees that the hirer can either return the goods and terminate the hiring or elect to purchase the goods upon completion of the payment of the stated sum. <clears throat> By the 1970s, higher purchase had become one of the most popular forms 
of commercial activity. And in addition to vehicles, other items like consumer durables and household electrical items were increasingly being obtained by people who either did not have the capital to pay for it or who did not want to pay for it and thought higher purchase was a better option. Finance companies also mushroomed as a result of the increased activity. And of course, after 1977, with the opening up of the economy and transport being privatized, by, but what we used to call the private buses, the trade really flourished. <clears throat> And as I said, finance companies had also mushroomed. And unfortunately, the higher purchase agreements were refined time and time again by finance companies to deal with every situation which had arisen before. I myself am guilty of that, of, of tailor-making agreements in case someone took up a defense in court, just for example, if there is a if there's a situation where they say they never came to Colombo to sign any agreement, everyone knows that these agreements are signed in the branches, but we filed a case in Colombo and an objection to jurisdiction is taken. But we had clauses which say the, it's where the breach occurs is where the payment is not made. And therefore, on the basis of cause of action, we could always come to the Colombo courts. Then sim similarly, there are other contracts where the acceptance by the company is what constitutes the completion of the contract. And therefore, they say that arises in the, in the courthouse nearer to the jurisdiction of the registered office of the company. So these agreements were time and time again refined to deal with every possible defense taken up by these poor uh, customers or these uh, uh, hirers. And <clears throat> the, that as a result, these agreements became hopelessly one-sided. And a hirer who never read the small print in his anxiety to obtain this item on higher purchase did not stand a chance against the might of these companies. Therefore, by the end of the 70s and the start of the 80s, there was a clamor to have some sort of leg legislation to regulate the business of higher purchase. And thus was born the Consumer Credit Act number 29 of 1982. As a result of this clamor by, by society in general. So it is not intended to go into great detail in the Consumer Credit Act because higher purchase somewhere down the line went somewhat out of fashion and taken over lock, stock and barrel by the trade in finance leasing, which, is, which became the more popular form of financing of mostly vehicles and of course sometimes consumer durables as well. And therefore, though there were advantages in higher purchase, for instance, once you complete your payments, if you have not made default and the contract has not been terminated at any time, just for the payment of a nominal sum like one rupee, the hire has a right to get the item hired into his name or to, for the title to pass to. In the Finance Leasing Act, as Mrs. Sri Ranti is bound to explain, that clause is not there in that form even though many co companies as a matter of good policy and as a matter of marketing expertise that they have been advised, they will do that. But under the act, there is no obligation to transfer the vehicle at the end of the lease. And a company which wants to be cussed to a particular customer can insist that they should return the vehicle at the end of the lease. <clears throat> So there are some clauses in the Consumer Credit Act. Uh, I have a few more minutes left. I can just 
draw your attention. Section 3.1 is the first requirement where the cash price must be indicated to the hire. These are all sections to mostly to uh, safeguard the rights of the hirers. Then section seven says that the hirer can, after 14 days notice to the owner, complete the purchase by paying the full hire purchase price for something that I need, need to explain is there's a, some sort of confusion, particularly in the more junior members of the bar about overdue interest and normal interest. So if you see the interest component is already built into the formula at the time the agreement is entered into. For instance, if the cash price of the vehicle is 500,000, and the owner has pay, is able to pay 200,000 as an initial deposit, then you, you are asking for a facility of 300,000. So if you add the interest, say for the time period, say it comes to 180,000, then it's 4 lakhs, 80,000 is the higher purchase price. Now there, if, for instance, if you have four years to pay it, it becomes 10,000 a month, 48 installments, pay, paying for 4,480,000. Uh, now, the, the important thing to realize is this, the 10,000 you're paying has a has a element or has a component of the capital and as well as a component of the interest. But if you, if you delay payments, if you're in default, the company is entitled to charge you an overdue amount of interest, which usually is very high. It used to be 4% in the early 80s per month, that is. Later, it even became 5% per month, which is 60% per annum. And the hirers, hapless hirers, have signed the agreement at that time, perhaps not intending to be in default but they have said they will pay this amount. So the Consumer Credit Act has many safeguards. It has rights and obligations of the hire and rights and obligations of the owning comp of the, of the company. But we are, we are not going into those details at the moment. If you have any questions about it, we can certainly deal with it at the time of uh, the question and answer. So uh, that is what I had to say about higher purchase, mainly as an introduction to this timely webinar on financial instruments relating to vehicles and consumer durables. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for that very informative and um, insightful uh, explanation of what uh, higher purchase is, because uh, that explains why there's such an exacting regime, statutory regime for higher purchase, which we are presently having. Um, now, I would like to uh, invite Mrs. Shiranti Gunawadana to explain the concept of finance leasing, which has now muddied the waters to some extent. Over to you, madam. Thank you, uh, Chintaka. Uh, first and foremost, as Mr. Ravi Agama correctly pointed out, now the higher purchase or the Consumer Credit Act is no longer being used by most of the finance companies. The finance leasing was appl applicable even from 1990. Finance leasing was used more for the light. At the time uh, when the Consumer Credit Act was in force, most of the company executives and corporate clients made use of the finance lease. This continued in this manner till the year 2000. In the year 2000, the government thought it's best to regulate finance leasing because by that time with the open economy, there were so many finance companies doing finance leasing, as well as there were some specialized leasing companies that came into being. Therefore, in the year 2000, they brought in the Finance Lease Act 56 of 2000. 
But do you remember when they brought the finance DCP and you come where, whereas the consumer credit tax, the master plan behind was Honorable Lali Tatulat Mudali. This, which was introduced by Mr. G.L. Paris, had more self-autonomy. Whereas in the consumer credit tax, if you read it, all the provisions is shall. But in the case of Finance Leasing Act, it is may. First and foremost, earlier, everyone was allowed to do higher purchase or finance leasing. With the introduction of this act under Section 3, it stated, any person shall not be eligible, eligible to be registered under this act unless such person is a licensed commercial bank, is a finance company, or a public company. So they made it compulsory, only these three categories and the specialized leasing companies can do finance leasing business, subject, however, to the provision that you should get registered with the uh, Central Bank of Sri Lanka, which is everywhere, annual license is issued to these companies. And they said, if it is an offense, if you carry on finance leasing business, without this license. Furthermore, they made it mandatory for all these companies to submit a manual under Section 7 of the Finance Leasing Act. But I'm sorry to say, say most of the finance companies, as well as the, the, when they do their contracts, the sums of the finance leasing uh, contracts are not in compliance with the manual. And there are only four mandatory provisions in the Finance Leasing Act, whereas all the provisions were mandatory. For example, they said Section 11, which gives you right of undisturbed position. Section 16, which talks about the supply agreement. Though you are not a party, you are a privy to that. Then comes the Section 21, which permits you to get damages. Section 24, which, you give, which has been amended by Act Number 25, uh, 24 of 2005, uh, where the assignment is taken. Uh, assignment is given where the finance company has the right to assign the con assign the finance leasing and get, uh, in other words, securitization where you can get finances from another licensed uh, financial institution for your day-to-day -day business. So therefore, remember, only these four are mandatory all the others you are free to contract as long as it is fair and just. Now, for example, now whilst in the consumer credit tax, the termination clause is very important for every contract. If it, if it is not less than, uh, if, if the rental is paid every fortnight, you have to give uh, one week notice. If it is more than that, 30 days, uh, 14 days notice for uh, non-payment of rental, 30 days for the breach, it is not so. The Act first said, when the 50, uh, 56th of 2000 Act said, it is, um, you have to give 21 notice, uh, but later on it was reduced to seven days. But remember, even though they said that if you want, you are free in your agreement to put seven days 21 days or 14 days. So there is self-autonomy in the finance lease agreement. Number two, there is where the termination is concerned. It is not mandatory to follow the procedure by sections 20 and section 21. You have the right to provide for it in the agreement. So with the very carefully drafted lease agreement, which is called finance lease agreement, you have the right to contract, have a fair contract where both parties can get benefit out of this contract. And the last but not the least is the question, the difference between consumer credit tax and finances. We are in the case of the consumer credit tax, you have the option to purchase, which is mandatory. And most of the time, the idle by reference to a catalog, or by choosing the article, the higher said, I want X, I want Z. But in the finance leasing, the finance lease company is the owner and the finance lease company has to lease it. But there is no 
undertaking or a guarantee to say that you are going to give the vehicle at the end of the finance lease. But under section 43D, you have, it is specifically mentioned, though not a high purchase agreement, you can mention that you are prepared to, you can, that you can purchase it, the lessee can pur purchase it at the rate, at, the, at a nominal price, or there is provision to extend the uh, lease. So therefore, whilst the high purchase is more mandatory provision, it now it has gone out of system, only more, the finance companies are doing more finance leases, but the mushroom companies, the so-called lease mafia, though these people talk about this lease mafia, these people are using the high purchase agreement because there is no necessity of a license to be issued by the central bank to carry on the business of high purchase. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam, for that uh, explanation, wonderful explanation on finance leasing. Now, finance companies often resort to um, criminal action. It, it's a it, it happens even with leasing and also with high purchase. And always inevitably when the vehicle is repossessed for non-payment of rentals or the hire, uh, we find that the lessee or the hirer often goes to the police to complain and it ends up as, as, as a criminal case. So to discuss the, and clarify the criminal aspects of higher purchase and finance lease, I'd like to call upon Mr. Vidura Ranavaka. Uh, Oti Vidura. Thank you, Chintaka. Yeah. Thank you, Chintaka. It's my duty to uh, explain the criminal aspect of the matters related to higher purchase and lease agreements as the civil aspect was covered by Mrs. Kirantikumadhan and Mr. Algama. So my task is to explain the criminal aspect of the issue. Now, if you take uh, the provisions in the higher purchase and the leasing uh, the statutory provisions relating to those agreements. There are, there are things that covers the criminal aspect of the matters relating to the agreements. Now, I would like to explain those matters under five topics. First one is the most important one, the recovery of goods by the, the, the owner of the finance company, or the lesser, both covers the finance company who gives the property. Now, first of all, recovery of goods, the most of the finance companies and also the customers think that the finance companies are having rights to recover goods as and when they want to recover with or without any resistance of the, 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 the hirer or the lessee. Now, that is a wrong understanding of the law and wrong understanding of the provisions. Now, I will explain the provisions relating to the Consumer Credit Act as well as the Finance Leasing Act. Consumer Credit Act, de Act deals with the higher purchase agreements. It doesn't provide any mechanism or any provision to recover goods using force or recover goods without getting the assistance of the poor. The relevant section is section 19, subsection C, where it says you have to, uh, you can, the finance company can get the possession of the article through action in court. So they will have to institute an action in court and then recover the possession from the person who had hired the, the article. So that is the provision in Consumer Credit Act as earlier explained. Now the Consumer Credit Act and the higher purchase agreements are out of time. The most important provisions we have to discuss are the provisions in Finance Leasing Act. Now Finance Leasing Act provides mechanisms to recover goods let under a lease agreement. Now there are two ways to recover. First is under section 27, you can recover the article from the higher, from, from the lessee if there is no resistance offered. That is very important. The operative words are the resistance offered or not. 
So when there is a resistance not offered by the higher, by the lessee, the finance companies are empowered to take possession of the, the of the article given under a lease agreement. Now before that, they will have to lodge a, uh, inform the the police station, the OIC of the police station. They have to notify the police police and get the assistance of the police to prevent the breach of peace and then get the possession. Now, that is when there is no resistance offered by the person who is having the possession of the article. Now, when there are resistance offered by the person who is having the possession of the article, they can't go and forcibly take the vehicle or the article given by them, though the ownership retains with the the finance leasing company. Then the provision is section in, given in section 28. When there is when when the finance company or the lessor can't take the possession back because of the resistance or because of the resistance that may have been there, then the the you have to go to the court and get a court order to recover possession and in the district court, you can get a decree to that effect, and thereafter, the, you have to execute that decree through court officers, like we execute decrees for movable properties. So those are the provisions in finance leasing. So finance companies in these days, I have seen in many cases, they have, they have employed several personnel for recovery of the articles. In many, in many cases, they have employed the, the people who can uh, use force illegally to recover the articles or some underworld gangs are given contracts to recover the articles by using the force and criminal intimidation. That is a wrong procedure and that is prohibited by law. And I would like to say that, that, that those procedures should not be followed and those are encouraging the underworld gangs and the thugs in this country. So therefore, those should not be encouraged. And further, the, the, there is a cost to that. And that cost also, they, they charge very high fees and they the, that cost also be, uh, now they, they are putting that cost also into the account of the, of the, uh, the higher or the lesso, lessee and recover that in a civil action. That is also wrong procedure. Then you have to bear in mind you cannot you cannot use force or criminal intimidation to recover any article given under Finance Leasing Act or Consumer Credit Act. That is very very specifically we have to mention. So then, in the event of recovery of possession of an article by using criminal intimidation or force or resist when the resistance is offered. The person who is recovering that, or who person who is getting the possession of that article can be charged for robbery, theft, or extortion, or then it can go up to criminal, criminal trespass, criminal intimidation. There are penal sections in the penal code. They can be charged before, the, before a criminal court and convicted and punished. But, I have seen in many cases the police, as well as in some cases the magistrates and the other judges, also are very reluctant to accept complaints made by by the the, the, the lessees in respect of taking over the vehicles without the consent of them. And then in those cases, they take, they they say these are these are civil agreements and the agreements. Therefore, they are not entertaining the, uh, the, the complaints relating to the, the matters uh, relating to the possession, getting the possession. So therefore, my, my, my position is there are, there are provisions to recover possession, but you have to go do it in the legal manner, even in the act itself, but you can't go beyond that to recover that. If you are going to do that, you can be prosecuted for criminal uh, acts that you have done. So those are the matters relating to the recovery of goods. Now there's another provision in the uh, 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 criminal law, 
relating to retention of goods by the hirer or lessee when the agreement is terminated. Now, when the agreement is terminated, in most of these agreements, the hirer or the lessee has to return the goods to the company or the finance institute. So if the hirer or the lessee keeps the possession of the, of the vehicle or the article without returning it to the finance company, he can be prosecuted for under uh, section 388 for criminal breach of trust because he is under obligation to return the, this thing, the, the article. If he is not returning that, he will be having an illegal possession of that and he can be subject to a prosecution uh, before a criminal court for criminal breach of trust. That is the second uh, item that I would like, I, I would like to uh, explain. The third point that I would like to raise is re receiving information of the goods. Uh, there is a criminal aspect in that. That is only under the Consumer Credit Act. The Le Finance Leasing Act does not provide any provision relating to that. Consumer Credit Act Section 15 uh, provides that when the, the owner or the finance institute requires to provide the information of the location of the goods, they will have to inform the hirer about when that is informed, the hirer is bound to provide that information. If hirer fails to do that, or if hirer does not comply with that provision, the hirer can be prosecuted before the magistrate court, and thereafter he can be punished upon conviction, and, and uh, upon conviction, five, 500 rupees fine, and three months simple imprisonment or any punishment, uh, uh, punished, uh, punished by the both provisions. So they, that is the, uh, the criminal aspect under section 15, that is only in Consumer Credit Act. And under section 17, the fraudulent sale or disposal of the, uh, the goods by the hirer also a criminal offense under section 17 of the act. They are upon conviction by the magistrate. He can be punished with 5,000 rupees fine and six months simple imprisonment or any, uh, any punishment comprising both of those. Then what is important here is the Finance Leasing Act does not provide any mechanism, any, any provision relating to the, the, the providing of information as well as the uh, prohibition of fraudulent sale of dis disposal of goods by the hirer, those provisions are not found in the Finance Leasing Act. The third, uh, the fourth point that I would like to address is offenses under the Finance Leasing Act itself. Under the Finance Leasing Act, there are certain mandatory sections, mandatory provisions that a finance company has to follow during the course of their business. Those are those were mentioned by Mrs. Gunawardhan in her address. But I section that is for an example, section two says carrying on finance leasing business without a certificate of registration issued by the central bank is an offense. Then section five subsection three says uh, the failure to exhibit the certificate of registration. Then section six says failure to pay the annual fee. Section seven says failure to provide the particulars under section seven, that is to uh, providing the operating manual. Section eight, uh, the altering the op operating uh, manuals and the articles of the as of association and the regulation. So if you are in breach of those, the finance companies can be charged for, uh, for offenses under the Finance Leasing Act itself. So upon conviction, if you are found guilty, two years rigorous imprisonment uh, and 10,000 to 150,000 fine can be imposed on the finance company and every director, manager or officer of the finance company who has done that offense is liable for the conviction and the, the, the relevant punishment. Then 
there is another section in finance leasing act that is section 40 that is willful act or omission in relation to the records and books so if there is willful act or omission in relation to the records and books of a finance company they can be charged under section 40 of the finance leasing act and upon conviction they have to face this the 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 similar the punishment that i have uh, stated earlier then there is another important aspect that we have to cover under this uh, topic that is the right to claim goods subject to higher purchase or leasing agreements in criminal cases now there are instances there are many there are many cases in this country where the uh, especially in relation with the vehicles when vehicles are taken into custody by police or any other uh, department officers relating to commission of crimes for an example if you transport illicit liquor using a vehicle which is subject to a lease or higher purchase the vehicle is taken into custody and produced as a as a uh, produced as a production before the magistrate court or the relevant court then when there is a when when a, when an article which is subject to a lease or higher purchase is produced there there are provisions in the criminal procedure code relating to the disposal of the articles those are the, the provisions starting from section 420 if it goes up to section 433a of the code of criminal procedure then what is important here is now in respect of a vehicle or a or an article given under higher purchase or uh, lease agreement there are two types of owners recognized now in law when a when a vehicle is given under finance leasing agreement or under a higher purchase agreement then at the time of registration you register an absolute owner and a registered owner so there are two types of owners so with this concept registering of an absolute ownership there are issues before the criminal courts in disposal inquiries when there are two contrary claims placed by the absolute owner and the registered owner the court had to prefer one to hand over possession of the vehicle or the article at the inquiry held under section 425 or 431 now in order to overcome this issue section 433a was introduced to the criminal procedure code by act number 12 of 1990 thereby the legislature preferred the claim of the absolute owner over the claim of the registered owner so the now the provision is there for the magistrate to give vehicle when there is a absolute owner registered the absolute owner's claim is preferred over the claims of the others so the vehicle has to be disposed in that manner under section and section 433a in the event of the magistrate deciding to hand over vehicle or dispose the vehicle uh, before the court so those are the matters relating to the criminal aspect of the articles uh, given under higher purchase and lease as well as the criminal uh, matters relating to uh, the relevant uh, statutory provisions thank you chintaka and i will explain anything more anything uh, necessary to explain uh, upon the yeah. thank you very much comprehensive uh, dealing with the matters arising in the criminal courts uh, with regard to higher purchase and uh, finance leasing now uh, this consumer credit act i'd like to pose this um, uh, question to mr raviyagama uh, it's a matter that we need to discuss about repossession Uh, section 21 of the consumer credit act uh, uh, stipulates that 
when 75% of the hire has been paid, the rentals have been paid, that there is an issue with regard to repossession directly, but uh, you have to go to court. Uh, could you please explain that provision, sir, because this, is, uh, this ha ha comes up inevitably in uh, higher purchase matters as well as in leasing matters, it's taken up as a defense sometimes. If you could explain that, please. The, the power of the court in actions to recover goods is what is stated in section 21. And the important thing here is in section 20 actually, where the goods have been let or agreed to be sold under a higher purchase agreement, and 75% of the higher purchase price has been paid or tendered by you on behalf of the hirer or any guarantor before the lawful termination of the contract. Owner shall not enforce any right to recover possession otherwise than by action. So the simple theory is if you have paid 75% of your higher purchase price, in that example I told you, 500,000 or 480,000 is the higher purchase price. If you have paid 360,000, but there is very a very important proviso in that section. Before the lawful before the lawful termination of the contract. So this section very often in 99% I would say of cases have not been invoked by the hirer or the guarantors for the simple reason that it is a very rare instance that there has been no default up to that time. That is all the time till the 75% payments were due, there are bound to have been defaults. And there would be instances where notices of termination have gone out and sometimes the termination has also been effected. So therefore, but it is certain if that has not been done and also it says the lawful termination of the contract. So if the higher, if they, if the higher purchase company says it has been terminated, that's not sufficient in their defense, they have to show that the termination was lawful. For instance, if notice, if notice of termination has not been given, then the termination is not lawful and you cannot get behind that provision. So, but in a rare situation where the, the, the payments have been made perfectly, I, I was in a case myself, uh, where we got some enjoining order also against the company from selling the vehicle after it repo was repossessed, where we had given a standing order to the bank to make the monthly installment, my client. And there was no default whatsoever. And these people, after the 75% had been paid, there was a default. By, by us and the vehicle was repossessed on the during the Nonagathya time on a in a uh, on the eve of the Singhala and Tamil New Year when very few uh, workmen are around and there were the uh, companies exist at very at us with a skeleton staff so the vehicle was repossessed and uh, the matter is still pending before court, so I cannot talk anything more about it. But that's, that's the situation. If you have paid up to 75% without default, and if, in other words, there cannot be a lawful termination, there could not have been a lawful termination, then you are entitled to the, to the protection of section 20 where the company has to take possession of the item or the vehicle only by recourse to courts. But of course, we all know, and 
again, I have to say that I have also been at, at both ends of this equation. And I used to advise or appear for finance companies. Sometimes we negotiate with a guarantor. And because they also have an obligation to return the vehicle. And we tell the guarantor, you consent to the judgment. And we will, there is a sort of a deal between the company and the guarantor that we will not, we will not uh, proceed against you if you assist us by consenting to judgment. And sometimes these, the, sometimes very gullible, uh, these guarantors are, and sometimes, of course, they have not been let down also. Once they consent to the judgment, then we have a judgment which also uh, there's one limb in the prayer to the plane of return of the vehicle in good condition or the, or the payment of its value. So since we have a judgment, immediately we go and take a writ of possession and seize the item, the vehicle or uh, well, the item that is hired. I hope I have answered the question, Chintaka, uh, to your satisfaction, to the satisfaction of the person who has asked it. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, we have opened the, the floor to the questions uh, from the participants. There are a couple of questions. Um, there's one for Mr. Uh, Ranamaka. That is, is there a provision to go to the MC for forceful recovery in the Finance Leasing Act or the Consumer Credit Act? Yes. I would like to say yes straight away because there are there are provisions given in the Finance Leasing Act to recover possession of the article. Now, recover for the recovery, there are two types of recoveries discussed there. First is recovery of article when the resistance is not offered. In very rare occasions, we find the the recovery of articles without any resistance. Now, this, if there is a resistance made or possible, they can't go and take the vehicle forcibly. Most of these finance companies and the, the, the persons that they, they employ go there, use criminal intimidation or sometimes assault or whatever it is, and then somehow take the possession of the vehicle. That is clearly illegal and that is not the way provided in the legislation. Then when there is a registration, uh, the, the, when there is a resistance or possible resistance, they have to go to court and get a court order to recover possession and execute in the execute the writ in the manner where you obtain possession of movements. Um, so that is the way to recover. So therefore, you can't just go and take the vehicle or the article from the person who, who possesses. So if you do it, you can. You are liable to be prosecuted for theft, criminal intimidation, or uh, then uh, uh, even robbery, or uh, then. Uh, so those are there are there are provisions. You can be you can be charged for criminal trespass. So there are certain provisions there under the penal code where the prosecution can be uh, established and the convictions can be made for that kind of acts. So my position is the finance companies should not encourage those matters and they have to they have to resort their relief to the methods provided by law. So. Thank you. Um, there's another question which deals with the same aspect. I think I'll first put it to Ms. Gunawadana. Is section 27 and 28, that is um, relating to recovery of position in the Finance Leasing Act, are they mandatory? And whether parties can agree to repossess without following the method in section 27 and 28? I think that also leads us to the to discussion of section 31, which is a rather strange provision contained in the Finance Leasing Act. I think Vidura can comment after Mrs. Gunawadana explains the methods. I think I'm muted.
I think uh, we will go on to the next question. Um, this, I think, is a question for. Uh, we have got a series of questions for. I, I think Mr. Algama can answer uh, these uh, until Mrs. I think we have lost Mrs. Uh, Gunadana for a moment. She'll be back. The questions are posed as to uh, Is it mandatory for a finance leasing company to be registered? in terms of the act? I think I already answered this question, but what do you say? Of course, it is mandatory, and there are penal provisions for engaging in the business of finance leasing if you are not registered in terms of the act. So that's a straightforward answer. Yes, you have to be. And there is another question it has without Without uh, it has come to the point of the beating on the bush, I think what we already discussed is what are the legality of seizing lease vehicles upon default by leasing companies? I understand that most leasing agreements provide that upon um, termination that they are entitled to recover position. What are your thoughts on that, sir? Well, I I wish I had thoughts on that, but as as I mentioned to the to. The secretary of the bar association. I haven't stepped into the uh, leasing and hire purchase court maybe now for about fifteen or twenty years, and I'm a little rusty. So I would leave it to Mrs. Shiranti Gunawardena to answer that question. Thank you. Sir. I think she's now back with us. Yes. Yes, madam. I'm sorry. We are glad to have you back. Just ask. Uh, one of the first question that I uh, put to you was regarding Section 31 and whether parties can opt out of Section 27 and 28 of the Finance Leasing Act. Um, th that is, uh, without following the provisions in 27 and 28, whether they can agree to repossess using any other method. Uh, could you please explain that, uh, Madam? I think you're muted at the moment. Can hear. Yes. Now, under Section 31, clearly says the parties to a finance lease may provide in such lease for the non applicability of provisions uh, in this part of the Act, other than the provisions contained in Section 11, 12, Section 11, 16, 22, and 20, uh, 24. Therefore, in my opinion, if the party, I, now I, when you look at the finance lease, if you carefully read that, in most of the finances they are provided, they have said we are uh, we are leaving out all uh, applicability of these provisions other than section 11, section 16, section 22, and section 24. Therefore, section 28 is not mandatory. If you want, you can leave out the applicability of section 28. But in a practical sense, in my opinion, we should make use of Section 28, because that is also a shorter method where you go to the civil court, you get a, you support it, ex parte, then you get an interim order, and when it's served, it becomes absolute, and then your right of reposition becomes quicker, right? Right of retaking position becomes quicker than waiting for a long drawn money recovery or DHP civil case. Thank you. Thank you, madam. The, I wonder if uh, Mr. Ranavaka has anything to contribute to that? Yes, yeah. yeah. There, there are provisions in section 31 to exclude section 20, the applicability of section 27 and 28. That is correct. But when you when there is a resistance, it is not only mere resistance. Now, when there is a resistance, when the vehicle is being taken, there are other, uh, the other offenses which may have uh, committed at that point of time. 
So for an example, you, when there is a resistance, you can just you can't just go and take the vehicle. Uh, you know, you have to use the criminal force. You you may have to use the the you you may have to use uh, the criminal intimidation, or you may have to use some other force to get the vehicle. So then in now the finance companies or any person employed by the finance company is not entitled to do those things. Therefore, my opinion is though those provisions can be excluded under Section 31 and though there are, there are conditions in the lease agreements related to that, still in appropriate cases, the criminal prosecutions can be brought in. When there is other of you know it may not be robbery it may not be theft or it may it may not be extortion but there may be other other offenses in the process of recovery thank you Idra. <laughs> it is that it although the law provides for repossession uh, where parties have agreed uh, it is a matter of it's a question of fact as to whether in to be decided on a case by case basis yes uh, there's one further question for Mrs. Gunawadana. Um, that is, uh, what is the difference between operational lease, a financial lease, dry lease, and wet lease? And are they statutory recognized terminologies? Yes. Now, in the case of a finance lease, means a finance lease, which is entered and the Finance Leasing Act 56 of 2000, which is permitted where the law permits only a duly registered uh, company or a bank or a public company with a leasing license to grant. Finance lease comes within the purview of Finance Leasing Act 56 of 2000 as amended. Operational lease is another concept. Most of the time, the operational lease where there are both parties have certain obligations and rights. The maintenance has to be kept on. Then the now if it is a vehicles, you can give it to one set of people. And there are when those employees go out, you can give to another set of people. So the operation lease is mostly also operational lease is used for equipment also. Then comes the dry lease and the wet lease. Wet lease is mostly used for aircraft. Wet lease means you take the crew and the full both are paid by that and we pay a lease rental for that. Dry lease means again a aircraft, we can take it on lease, but the crew and the full is not uh, made with the lease rental. That also we have to bear. So that is those are the four types of leases, but there are many other leases also. But these, when you look at a financial angle, these are the four types of leases which are Done. Thank you, madam. Um, then there's one further question. I think um, if I may also yes. just add, yes, add a word to what Mrs. Gunawardner said. Yes. The don't ask me why it's called wet and dry. It's that is anyone's guess. But uh, <laughs> the wet lease uh, provides that uh, the lessor exercises operational control. And the, in, a, in a dry lease, the lessee exercises operational control. I just, that's a further explanation to what Mrs. Gunawad just mentioned, which is perfectly correct what she said. Thank you very Thank much. You. Then so there's one further question regarding this interest uh, as to whether in a finance lease, I think uh, either you or Mrs. Gunawad or both of you can answer this. In a finance lease, um, is it mandatory for the finance company to break down the interest and the capital component, or is there any 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 concept of that in uh, in these matters? This is ordinary. We will have to answer that. Yes, you know, in a finance lease, it is amortization. You know what? It is called amortization. Is amortization is where there is no interest. They take into consider the term amortization. In the finance industry, is a reference to a process of writing off a cost of an item over a period of time. The whole of the purchase uh, price of the vehicle or the equipment is re uh, is repaid to the finance company in stages over the finance period. And this view is supported by 
Section 43B of the Finance Leasing Act. Section 43B of the Finance Leasing Act, the definition section, clearly says mm, for the payment by the lessor to the lessee for possession and the use of such an equipment or such sums to be calculated so as to take into account, in particular, the amortization of uh, the whole or substantial part of the cost of the equipment. Therefore, there is no question of interest. It is calculated on this basis of amortization. Thank you, Madam. There is a question by one of uh, the participants. I think we have already answered it as to whether, um, since there is no question of ownership passing at the end of a finance lease, whether there is a, uh, whether in the case of a vehicle, there is a question of ownership not pa actually passing at the end of the lease. I think Mr. Algama answered this at the beginning, uh, but are there, do you have any thoughts? Uh, and they have asked, are we using incorrect terminology or is there a different legal explanation for the vehicles being, the ownership of the vehicles passing at the end of the lease? Actually, it's it's a matter largely in the discretion of the company. Ninety-nine percent of the cases, in any case, as we know, the item leased has depreciated over thirty-six months or forty-eight months or sixty months, and the book value of that uh, item is actually negligible as far as the company is concerned. Of course, we perhaps we are in the only country where where vehicles are an investment and you can sell a vehicle for 10 years down the line for, for a higher amount than what you bought it for. And so what happens is uh, in, in the case of uh, 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 what was the question, Chintaka? The... Whether it is um, whether, they, whether, it, whether vehicles actually the, the property passes when it comes to vehicles as opposed to other, other equipment. So, so there is no legal requirement, but what happens is at the end of a lease, the companies usually transfer the ownership uh, or delete themselves from their special interest or absolute ownership and let the lessee have the full, full ownership, unencumbered ownership of the property. Maybe Mrs. Gunawardna might be able to add to it if necessary. Uh, you know, actually, the Finance Leasing Act number 56 of 2000, section 43D, clearly states, it says, finance lease means an agreement between a lessor and lessee. And it goes on to say under 43D, which though not a higher purchase agreement within the meaning of the Consumer Credit Act number 29 of 1982, may or may not provide for the extension of the period, uh, initial period set out in the paragraph A or for the purchase by the lessee of the equipment after the expiration of the initial period set out in paragraph A or the period extended under the paragraph. Therefore, there is a possibility, if should you wish to, even in a finance lease, you can include a right to purchase. Thank you, madam. There is also a question that has come up, lots of questions. Um, do you think imp uh, improving um, contract literacy will reduce cases of litigation in court? I think there's an issue because uh, literacy of the contracts, most of the contracts are in English. So there's a question as to whether the customer is actually aware of whether he's getting a lease or a, a higher purchase. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that, Vidura? Yeah, I think it has to be improved. But the only thing is this: at the time of the signing of uh, signing of the contract, the anxiety of the lessor, lessee, is to get the article. So whether it is in English or in Sinhala, it is very hardly seen that they go through the agreements. That is not. Uh, because of the language it is written, even if, if, it, uh, if it is in singular language, it will be in a, uh, very, very uh, sing in, in singular words where you, you don't usually use, 
so the it will be more difficult for him to read and understand if even if it is in their own language but the the issue here is not that one issue here is they should be really info, informed about the nature of the contract that is there but i don't think that will make any difference thank you thank you intaka uh, if i may add to what yes, mr ranavaka said many agreements that we see today have a clause on the signature page of the contract that the terms of this have been explained to us in a language understood by us or very often in singhala or in tamil by an officer of the company and we are acquainted with all the whether it has been done or not the, this clause is there and the, the the customers also sign below that clause i suppose that takes us to the question non effective which i think rarely gets uh, appeared in our courts but perfectly right there is a question uh, posed to all the panelists uh, i will read out the question it's a long question most of the legal provision seems standing to protect the lessee and not the lessor in case how could the finance how could the finance company succeed in beating willful defaulters especially to protect public money should the existing legal framework be amended may i go first yes of course sir. yes that is an important thing very often people think that the disadvantaged party is the customer or the hirer or the lessee and that this they go on to tie entire to, to pass titles like unscrupulous and unconscionable on the companies who engage it will the, i cannot say that some of those allegations are completely unfounded but it is important that especially public companies which also use the deposits that are placed by people in those companies in other avenues of financing they must be safe the, there must be some safeguard for the for those finances why i say this is there are organized customers who actually take facilities with the intention of defaulting from the first installment itself so sometimes there is a ring of customers a b and c in one contract a is the hirer b and c are the guarantors in the next one b is the hirer and a and c are the guarantors and in the other, third one c is the hirer and a and b are the so on and so forth and it is it is correct that the uh, the lady or gentleman who has asked this question says that many of these safeguards have come favoring the lessees because that was to protect them from an almost powerless position that they were earlier where the companies called the shots and there was hardly any protection for these people it always de uh, depends on the policy of a government for instance during the government up to 19 from 1977 up to uh, 89 90 the policy of the government was to build more houses but people were not building houses because they couldn't if they had more than the houses they actually needed they couldn't get it back from a tenant due to stringent laws so if you see from that point all the legislation 55 of 1980 and even the subsequent legislation have been to protect the landlord whereas before that it was almost a, a crazy protection for the tenant as it were so these the, the balances keep changing according to the policies of the changing governments and uh, the point is well taken that there must be provisions for the safeguarding of the finance companies as well we have seen how many finance companies even strong what were considered very strong have completely collapsed during the recent during the not so recent and recent past thank you i yes, agree sir. with 
may I add something to that? But yes. Mr. Ravi Gama said, you know, as you are well aware, now the litigation has become so prolonged and protracted, it will take for you at least seven years to recover your money and your possession of the vehicle. You know, you must be aware there are so many depositors in this country who have put their money into these public deposit, the public companies, the finance companies, which are very hard money. Therefore, we will have to find a way, a, a summary procedure where recovery is concerned. And also, it has become a very big business today for vehicles to be alienated, illegal transfer of vehicles. Now, there was a recent case in Mahara Courts where 288 vehicles were found to be in a yard of a pawn broker. Therefore, we have a very big issue where the public deposits cannot be paid due to the present situation. So I think there should be reforms of law which should be brought in to make more quick summary disposal of all these matters where the willful defaulters are concerned, where the genuine defaulters are concerned, it is different. But as Mr. Algama correctly pointed out, there's gang of people who are operating with the willful, with the they they are default everything, their bank loan, their inland revenue, you know, all that. When you go to these courts, you'll see the same client in for defaulting for five companies. It's the same client. If you I don't know whether their trip is checked or not. Therefore, I think we need very quick reforms to these laws for quicker, speedier, more transparent recovery process. Thank you, madam. Uh, there's just uh, two more questions, both uh, connected. One is relating to reshadowment, other is relating to uh, refinancing. Um, on reshadowment, the question is, are there any provisions in the leasing act to reschedule the loan? There is no such provision, but uh, do you have any thoughts on that, uh, madam? You, can, you know, reschedulement is where you are extending the period, right? Then there is a reason, there was a case also, Union Bank case of the Supreme Court, which says in a reschedulement, the guarantor's liability continues. Therefore, I think reschedulement is possible. Also now remember, the central bank has given moratoriums every due to the pandemic situation in the country. Therefore, it is reschedulement because by statute, the statutory provisions are brought in and not to, there are government circulars which are given. There are about four or five circulars, five of 2020, six of 2020, where it, it has been mandatory to give uh, extension of the time to defer the interest payment. Therefore, reschedulement has become acceptable and recognizing in, recognizable in law. Uh, just a quick answer to this question, the last question I think we can take. From most of the instances we couldn't find, the, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. What is the process of granting refinance lease facility and sale and lease back facility for existing customers? Is it possible to grant new contract without signing new agreement? I think that is the same thing. And to continue the previous agreement <laughs> using the same uh, guarantors. So whether you can continue uh, uh, as a second facility with the same guarantors. So, uh, any thoughts, uh, Mr. Agama, sir? I think you're muted, sir. You're muted at the moment, sir. I'm so sorry. Uh, you certainly can, as the Union Bank case uh, quoted by Mrs. Gunawad showed, guarantors continue to be liable even once the period of payment has been uh, scheduled. And in the case of a refinance, you have the, I would think the company will have the option, if necessary, to ask the lessee to bring new guarantors, which of course becomes a new contract. If it's a refinance, I am, I stand corrected by any other panelists here. Thank you, sir. I think that is all we have time uh, now for questions. I would like to um, thank the distinguished panelists who have, uh, uh, it has been a very informative discussion. So thank you all, Mr. Mrs. Shiranti Gunawadana, Mr. Ravi Algama, and Mr. Vidra Ranavaka for a 
very enlightening discussion on this matter. I'd also like to thank the Bar Association of Sri Lanka. And of course, special thanks goes to the secretary, assistant secretary and the team behind the webinar series. For organizing this very valuable and um, in very informative platform where we can share knowledge. Sharing knowledge is the most important thing these days. And uh, thank you all. And of course, a big thank you to all who participated. I'm sorry I could accommodate all your questions. There are some questions I may not have been able to answer due to constraints of time. But uh, I hope you found all found the discussion very helpful. Thank you all. And I wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jintaka. Thank you, Jintaka. Thank you, Jintaka.